All right. Good evening, everyone. This is the Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting. It is 6.05. We can stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, if we can go around the table, starting with uh, Mr. Miller. Does everybody can just state their name for the record? Dane Miller. Megan Weber. David Rathke. Dane Oaks O'Neill. James Harris. Connor Kurtz. Rob Hurley. All right, thank you. We have two teachers joining us today. Uh, and they're going to present first, I think, on the high school media and theater course. Uh, uh, maybe Mr. Hurley yeah, wants to um, an overview. Basically, uh, both of these teachers, Mr. Um, they both of our teachers have decided to, uh, to create uh, different courses. Um, obviously, the curriculum hasn't been written in this time. One is called Foundations of Literature, and the other is a high school media course. Um, I put these are outlines of the course that they created for you guys. Um, it'll give you a, a rough idea of some of the topics that they're interested in covering. Um, the, Mr. Hoffman and Mr. Palmer uh, obviously put this together for you. Um, I brought them here tonight. We asked them to come tonight uh, just so they can answer questions about the proposed course for you. Um, we think it, from an administrative standpoint, we do think it would add value um, to our curriculum and what we do with our kids. You can see one is very contemporary in terms of what it does. And obviously we have a high interest in theater um, in our school district. Um, as you can see through our musical productions. And so we, we think there's value. We also think there's student interest in regards to these topics. So if you can kind of take a look through that and then uh, maybe Mr. Palmer or Mr. Hoffman can answer any questions that you might be able to have about their ideas. I think I do have a question just about, this is replacing the Shakespeare course. And is that, um, I imagine, like for me, I thought that was one of the points of pride of our high school curriculum that we taught Shakespeare. We had this course, and uh, I wouldn't want to see something like that necessarily go to the wayside. So, could you explain a little bit why we're replacing Shakespeare with this? Is it just was interest waning in Shakespeare, or I'll I'll start anyway. Um, I've been the teacher of that course, and I'd say interest has has remained constant. Um, but the other course that we're looking to implement is a course that. I would be looking to head. And while Shakespeare has been popular, Mr. Hoffman wasn't in the building when I started it. And I think Mr. Hoffman is an outstanding asset um, with theater. And Shakespeare easily rolls into the theater course. So I don't think we'd lose it. We would just uh, have it become a component of what he'd do. But he could, he could bring a much richer level to what we could do with, with the theater facility that we have and the stage and all those sorts of things. So that's, that's the thought process. Would the theater course actually be meeting in, on the stage in the auditorium? Absolutely. I would Good. see that absolutely as a, as a great lab for us to work at. Use our space. Great. Um, and for the media productions course, um, I know I, at least here, have complained about how we do yearbook in Daniel Boone, how it's its own class, and how I think that would be better if we could brand that as editing, as uh, publications, as something like if I'm a, a college admissions officer and I see that uh, a student did yearbook for three years, I'd be much more impressed if, if that course had something to do with, uh, if it were titled, you know, design, publication, um, uh, production, or something beyond, uh, or even something journalism related, because you, I'm sure they touch on these skills in that course. Um, so would media productions be doing the, would that replace the yearbook class, or is this something in addition to yearbook? No, um, media productions is really the idea of trying to continue to expand um, our development of the media lab down by the library. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, I took over what was called Announcers Club a number of years ago, and we rebranded it this year as Blazer Media, and we're moving into that space. And most neighboring districts that I've had the chance to visit and learn about their programs have fleshed out programs in this area with you know dedicated spaces and teachers who work with it. And this is trying to move us in that direction. Um, and the yearbook is operating in that space. I'm hopeful that in the future we get our newspaper working in that space. Um, and we may even be able to expand some of the kinds of productions that we make. Um, 
So this is really just to, to give us the, the, the tools to teach the kids what they need and to give them time where they can develop some of the things that you know, some of the projects we're already working on and we're very limited in time as far as what we can do um, outside of the classroom setting. Great. Yeah, I think those skills, especially, um, looking here, even social media, um, there are a lot of jobs in social media now, and like any any company, any major company is going to have social media as a position in their communications department, advertising, um, publishing, all of these things. I think would really add to um, they would they would give a lot of students a lot of information that'd be helpful for job hunts in the future because this is what jobs are going to look like. I think. They're going to be technology based. They're going to be creative to an extent. It's not going to be wood shop. I know there are some board members. Uh, actually, Mrs. Price has talked about bringing back metal shop and these things, which may be valuable, but I think these are the types of things that will be more valuable. Um, but actually, on the yearbook question, we did rebrand that this year, didn't we? I remember there was a discussion on rebranding that course, and I think we did. Um, we did. Do you remember what we retitled it by any chance? Not off the top of my head. Okay. okay. Whatever I say, we'll probably be <laughs> All right. But I want to say publishing is a component of it. Okay. All right, great. I forgot about that. I'm, I talked about that for years, and we finally were able to, to do that. I should have remembered. Um, okay. I, does anybody have any other questions? I asked a bunch here. Mr. Rathkip? So for the, uh, the theater uh, course. Yes, sir. Is, is our... Um, is our lighting and, and sound up to snuff for what you want to do that's over there? A, that's an excellent uh, question, sir. <laughs> um, we did just get a brand new light board over the summer, which is state of the art. It's, it's very similar to the one that uh, the middle school actually has now. So we are working with newer technology there. Um, and as the theater continues to become a laboratory for a classroom like this, I could see um, doing incremental improvements that through things like the drama club that we raise money for and, and continue to improve upon. But yeah, we do have um, some new equipment that we're excited for. We've got some new mic lavaliers that work and all kinds of good stuff. And we, we'll, we'll have to, I mean, as our, I know, I know we do sets, but we have our set construction and our makeup, yeah. we have, we're all. Yeah, Mr. Warham, actually, uh, the technology teacher at the high school has, has taken on stage crew and really that has become his baby to learn and, and incorporate that into some of his architecture classes and such. So it's become pretty cool as it becomes more uh, co-curricular. And I will say all of these courses and all of bringing them on in the conversation and discussion that we had as the administration, there's already a core group of interest. This is designing curriculum for programs kids want. I mean, Mr. Hoffman has had the opportunity to workshop a couple times for kids who are interested in the theater program um, and really, really have a strong response. And how can we better use a resource we have um, for our students who have an interest and are going to pursue this after high school. So they um, came to us with the ideas and it's, it, they've done so much already in the thinking through and developing the interest. Um, so we're very pleased to have them and to have this come on board if possible. I do have a request. Can we please do Our Town? Our Town? Yes. As, are you coming to see, I remember, Mama, it's very similar to Our Town. Oh, I'll have to put yeah, that on my calendar. Yeah, it's coming up November 17th and 18th. Very similar. Um, the, the entire memory play kind of thing. Very huh. similar. Yeah, I love Our Town. Yeah, I'd love I if we can. For sure be on the docket. If we can do something like that, yeah, that would be oh, wonderful. Anything else? I need to practice to... Uh, Make up on the head, or just uh, <laughs> I've been trying. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we've got all the textbooks already and everything, so it's it's really just using the resources that we already have to implement a course that students seem to be already chomping at the bit to try. We would we would need to write a formal curriculum for the course. There it would be a little bit of expense involved in that, just to be transparent. What is the timeline? This would be for next year, I imagine. That should be so plenty of time. Yeah, we will be able to do it because they're isolated courses, so we should be able to do that by next year. Okay. Yeah. So we, as an administration, we are finalizing and working through the budget, budget and finalizing that, and then the next big thing is our course selection guide. So we'll bring that to either November or December. Do we see any other changes when it comes to course offerings, additions, subtractions? We're not going to be able to present okay. at this time All right. where things are. 
Well, I don't have any objection. Any el anybody else have comment? I think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess it would go on to the board agenda uh, for approval. Yep. And we will, it'll be in the course agenda also. Or, I mean, I don't know, yeah. that might be the best way to do it. We might not need formal approval to add a course. If we're going to approve the course selection guide and it's listed as yeah. a course. And then you'll approve the curriculum once it's been final. Okay, yeah. I think that's the we'll best start, approach. We'll start doing some back end work on the curriculum just to so make yeah. a reasonable support. All right, great. Gentlemen, thank you for coming here. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Guys for thank your time. you. See ya. See you guys. <laughs> All right, next up on the, the agenda. Oh. Mr. Kurtz, yes. my interest in opening up Woodshop is to create some real life skills that the students can graduate with. And I understand this is important to me also to have marketable skills for um, career, but my interest in, in, in having the kids having some hands on skills hands -on. is what ties into you know, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I would just say when it comes to social media and all everybody that, everybody gets I houses, everybody needs to learn how to cut some boards and frame a door and you know, do some electric wiring. And I think I would like to see our kids empowered with some of those skills, although I understand that's becoming obsolete. All right, well, next up, I think you actually can I see that agenda. Next up is the uh, coral reef update. Okay, a um, couple of things. First, I sent over some pictures later this afternoon. You can view them later on. They're just two pictures of, of what's going on, example pictures. Uh, to give you an update of how the project's coming, first, let me be clear. It is a research project, and it's for student learning. It's not a decoration project, although it does look really nice when you do walk into the room. Uh, but keep in mind, it's not like some uh, thing you would see at the restaurant or things like that. What you see when you go in the room is you see a couple tanks. Um, you have a sick tank, and then you have the, the actual model tank, and then the science experiments that are going on itself in the room as well some whiteboards and things like that for the project as you work through it um, the, we kind of worked out worked out a good situation with Rosemont as as you know we're partnering with them on the research itself we ran into some problems because the aquatic life because of all the hurricanes we are having difficulty purchasing it and the professor from Rosemont uses connections to acquire uh, some of the aquatic life that we needed so that worked out really well and that partnership is really um, what well, were his connections like what? he was able to find them from elsewhere in the ocean and, like well uh, I think he because of the type of field he's in he knows experts and those people um, who have access to these types of resources well they it wouldn't happen and it wouldn't happen if it were for him so that's been a real positive situation for us um, right now they are in the process of developing a website also as part of the project um, there's a scientific research that's going on that goes on in the AP class as well as after school stuff um, so it's being used there and it's being used after school as part of the club um, they are creating a website as an informative website they are also they're going to enter this into the uh, Lexus eco challenge and hopefully we can do well there again just so you also know and that we don't have any promises at this point in time we have reached out to PDE and um, there is at least a possibility and this is no promises whatsoever um, that the Secretary of Education might come out and visit hmm. um, that, that's not a promise yet they, he's looking at their schedule right now so there are so some good things happening with it how many tanks are in the room oh I'd say about I saw about five okay. I'd say about five where's the room so one of the tanks, just so you do know, and Shelly's not here, they have dedicated one. They've gone on a little bit of an offshoot on one of them, and they're using it for the life skills kids and special education. Now, that's a freshwater tank. They, they kind of took that a little bit different. What are, what are they doing? What's that? that? What are they doing? It's a freshwater tank with life skills. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't yeah. mean, I don't with know what like, that means. Uh, it's a freshwater tank. Adopt a fish. So there's, they're, they're, they're fishing. They're, they're maintaining, maintaining it. it. Okay, I was wondering yeah. like what that means. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, like, it's yeah. life skills. Life skills. Is, okay. Uh, um, Extraordinary learning disabilities. Will yeah, well, that's what I was wondering. Like, what are they the so tank maintaining? Okay. That's yours. good. Okay. They're not doing research. That's what I was. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't clear. Um, all right. Any other questions on the tank, coral reef? Please note on the right. We've gotten over all the hurdles there as far as electricity, supplies, electricity. Now, we're up to five tanks. We're going to need more power. Yeah, we. <laughs> that happened, and um, it, those things happen, and it did happen, and but nonetheless, it, it's there. We're not asking for anything. I mean, it, it's for it's now. up and running. Um, I just want to let you know there is learning going on, there is research going on, as intended. Um, so the outcome could be very good for us. What well, is very good for us at this point in time? Um, certainly, there was a mistake made in that area, but nonetheless, um, at least there's some educational benefit coming. So, so what are they hoping to? 
what's, what's some of the goals? Uh, it's part of, it, as I outlined when we originally did the project, it's part of a research um, at the professors doing at the college itself. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to create an ecosystem where the, um, it's actually, it's a self-sustaining ecosystem where and they're trying to see what works and what doesn't work. And they're doing experiments to see what grows. Certainly, like, I'll give you an example. They were, they had, and boy, this is not my field, so just bear with me. They had one type of, um, uh, living organism, we'll call it, in the one tank, and they were trying different types of chemistry in the tank to see which would promote the growth. So, that was uh, one uh, thing. They were say, oh, effort to restore damage or, or dead coral. Oh, that's or, part of what they're doing. That's not entirely. They're, they're not taking. They are trying to restore some dead coral or, coral or things that um, need restoring. There's that is part of what they're trying to do. They're also trying to experiment and learn what works best. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, hands-on learning, but hands-on learning in science. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the thing I like about this is it's authentic learning. It's not learning from a textbook. It's learning by doing. It's learning by using real scientific method and doing real research in a classroom, which has long-term effects for students. How many kids do we have that are pretty and, and Megan could probably answer. When I've been in the room, uh, better than I could, but when I've been in the room, I've seen it probably about 10 kids, 11 kids every time I've walked into the room, but I'm not there all day. Keep, I'm hit and miss when I walk in there after school or if I walk in during a, a classroom. So there's probably more involved in it than that. But it's going to be a class and a club, wasn't it? Wasn't there like a club component? There's there's the club component, the kids who are involved in it, but it is it is discussed and um, used in classes, but there's not an official course for it. Given oh, the okay. Um, there's an AP environmental science class that is in existence that talks about certain components and other courses, but no, there's not like a choral class or a class that does Just take that. advantage of the materials. Would that be an accurate right. description? I guess. Exactly. It, it's, it's a resource for them to use to study. All right. Thank you. Next up, civics update. Okay. Um, Carol had requested a civics update. Let me give you an idea of where we're at right now, um, and, and we can discuss a little bit about where we're going, and um, hopefully uh, we can do it in, in a reasonable time frame here. Right now, what we have done, we have a draft done of a seventh grade uh, U.S. history course that would include civics. Um, there still needs to be some more collaboration done on this uh, department. What we found, we were doing some work on our sixth grade, and, and we, we still need to work with our staff a little bit in terms of collaboration K-12. We did have a meeting K-12 with representatives, but we need to expand that. That's one thing we found out. There has been a little, there has been some delays in terms of what we're doing because of substitute teachers, things of that nature. It just holds up the process because when you have people out to write curriculum, what ends up happening is we pull people, people out of classrooms if you want to do it well. Well, we have some, I do not want to create a sub-problem by doing that. So some of that has been going on. But just to give you an update, we have we have a draft of the curriculum in sixth grade. Um, we, we worked on, or in seventh grade, and then we worked on a little bit in sixth grade. Um, I do need to do some more collaboration, um, and Michelle and I are certainly going to sit down with some representatives from K-12 um, to look at some of the other, other curriculums and areas there. It was interesting, we were talking about this, Michelle and I, and she had a great idea, which I, I did not think of, I don't mean to throw this out there. And um, she thought about one way to incorporate civics, um, especially at the high school level, which we need to dig deeper ourselves and collectively as an administrative team, but I thought this was really good. Um, creating a current events course, but an issue-based current events course where there's debate involved, which to me is real good because what you're doing is you, you have kids looking at issues from all different angles, um, current event types of problems. It, it might be a unique way to bring civics um, alive for kids, um, and it might be something that we at least need to explore that as, as well, a possible. Well, so on that note, though, I think it's very important that we allow these students to have views, some views that may be unorthodox, so to speak, and be allowed to express those views. And I wouldn't want to ever see our school district um, even, certainly not officially um, censoring speech, but just de facto. Students are, feel afraid or threatened to voice certain ideas because they may not be popular or because they may be uh, construed as, uh, I don't know, not being quite politically correct. And I don't want to see some of the things that are happening on college campuses around the country where classes are shut down, where professors are berated. Um, we need to have free exchange of ideas in, in school. Um, and of course, children don't, it's not the same thing as uh, being in the public square, but they do they do not lose their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse gate. And I, I hope that we are 
will always be a school district where these ideas, where students can exchange ideas without fear of uh, being um, shut down, whether by their peers or by the school itself. And I don't think that's an issue now, but I just want to say it because it seems to be creeping in higher education. I thought the discussion was on um, us being ahead of the curve as far as HB 1858, which requires public schools, including charters and cyber charters, to administer to students the same 100 question test used by Homeland Security's U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. They're looking to start that in the year 2020 to 2021. And if approved, passing the test would be a requirement to approve a high school diploma or GED equivalency. But I thought the original discussion that we had in this group. There, there meeting was, was some discussion on that. Yeah, I didn't think it really went anywhere. I, didn't, I, didn't I thought we were waiting for No, that we, um, we talked about that for a while. And I think that would be excellent. And many states do um, give the citizenship test to students. And some make it a prerequisite for graduation. 60% or better is what the bill is. Is this a, a bill in the state legislature? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that was something we that discussed years ago. That was the genesis ago. of it um, in 92816 when I started this discussion yeah. last, no, about a year ago. And this is something that I've had, I've wanted to do for a while, too. It hasn't gone anywhere. Maybe it can in the future. I think one of the challenges we ran into is having the materials available. It's online. Um, yeah, but there still have to be student-ready versions. Um, so we didn't move forward with it, okay. but I think that's a... Just well, for the administration, I think that could be another avenue we follow. I just think it's so important. I think <laughs> the primary rule. That would ahead if this rule is if this uh, legislation well, does pass. Our kids would be up and ready to go with it already. Well, they should already be ready to go because I imagine that the civics we're teaching. I, I certainly hope that we are teaching the basics. And I imagine we are, um, but that is, I think, the fundamental role of a public education system. It's to provide every citizen with a baseline knowledge to be a contributing and functional member of a free and liberal society. Um, so that's the goal of public education, and an ancillary goal is to learn for the sake of learning. So I think that's why, for me, that's why civics has been so important in this entire discussion, because it is the basis of our, of our form of government, and we need a knowledgeable citizenry, especially in the, the basics of citizenship. Um, so anyway, I'm glad we're moving forward and always keeping that at the forefront as an area where we can always do better, because I think that is our core one of our core competencies. <clears throat> Any other talk on civics? <clears throat> you gather that that bill hasn't gone, gone anywhere, right? Where is, do you have any idea where that stands? When was that, is that a, in the legislature now? Is it in the committee? Has um, it been passed? There's a hold on it because of the new requirements with ESSA that, <coughs> that we had to come in compliance. But that was approved a couple weeks ago, so the state, they might start working on this again. It was approved in 2015 by Arizona. <laughs> Other but in states, Pencil. 14 states have adopted the specific test requirement and 10 to 22 consider doing so. Okay. Yeah, in Pennsylvania, uh, we have to get an update. Uh, my understanding is that it was kind of put on the back burner until here Governor Wolf ordered a two year hold on it. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, oh, I, sorry. I totally agree. I think civic is important. I mean, you ask a lot of folks, they just don't know how, right. how, how government works or how the United States. Yeah, or even but the branch of government. I, but by, by, this, by the same token, you know, we sit here and, and opine about the number of tests and requirements for graduation. Right. So, you know, I, I try to lead the way. Yeah. Although I will say, I would much prefer individual school districts to assign these types of tests rather than being forced down from the state or the federal government. Because that's the way it should be. It should be local schools regulating themselves and not us being told how to do things. Would the current events class be an elective? Right, right now, we that's a preliminary discussion. So yeah, I think that would be an elective type of course. But that is such in the preliminary stage. I was more brainstorming at this point. That in was time. a. What do you think about this idea? Mm -hmm. of yeah. conversation? But it was in my. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a great idea. First, well, we. And of course, I mean, I think when, whenever you offer a course like that, right, where people are going to have lots and lots of different opinions and ideas, you have to set it up with the right teacher with some guidelines. Like, well, frankly, you though, well, so they're going to go to college and they're going to have Absolutely. courses that are socially directed and they're not going to have any experience debating and having those types right. of public discussions and being comfortable with discussing sensitive issues and being able to do so. And I think that, yeah, well, I mean, you know, they're used to social media 
you know, rants and and so that's a good start to giving them that avenue to have that discussion and, and be better prepared for, for college. I'm going to go one step further, though, if you don't mind. And I, instead of having a single course dedicated to these things, what if shouldn't that really permeate all of our courses at the high school? That there should be robust debate, not necessarily the focus of the class, but we shouldn't. And I'm I'm sure some teachers fosters that. But I think that you know when you're learning, that's how you learn. You have to articulate your view. You have to defend it, and that. That contributes to the entire to the learning of the whole thing. And I would say that does happen in a variety of our courses, depending on the topic. Law and anthropology brings up a lot of discussion, along with psychology. Some of our English literature courses, depending on what they're reading, it happens in many aspects. Because um, I was actually trying to think, um, different teachers at different times do require <laughs> the discussion of current events and bringing in articles and coordinating them. Um, so it happens, again, some, in some cases organically, some cases it's part of how they implement the curriculum. And, um, there's a variety of courses that I do think it occurs, um, not in every course by any means, but at the same time I think, yeah, uh, yeah not too many times. Um, but realistically, it, it occurs and the students do have the opportunity, especially the curriculum and the courses that it happens are, are as the students mature. They start it and it's addressed in one issue in one way at a ninth grade level. And then as things progress through the curricula, by the senior year, um, our, what many students still think of as our POD course, which is actually not um, titled that, um, but that course, our 12th grade social studies course. What is our, what is it titled? Quiz me today, and I'm not remember. <laughs> this is why we call it POD. Like, correct. And that's why we haven't gotten it in. All right. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, and just creating not just people who, uh, the debate, we have to be, we have to cultivate not just people who know civics, but who can think independently and who don't think, oh, well, this is, um, this is my tribe, and my tribe happens to be in the Oval Office, and the leader of my tribe likes to tweet, and then this is my tribe, and we do not like the person in the Oval Office who likes to tweet. Like, that seems to be so much what politics is now, just associating with, uh, with a group instead of associating with ideas. So... Any way we can, we can change that here in Daniel Boone, I, I'd like, but anyway. Next up on the agenda, unless there's anything else on that. Okay, and I, I was supposed to note, too, um, that Mrs. Bites arrived at 610. And also Mr. Uh, Mr. Sc uh, Scott is here and Mr. Wolf, too. And feel free to contribute. Well, you already have, but... <laughs> I'm a member of the public. Yes, at the table here, in the place of honor. But, uh, all right. Uh, next up, early child, oh, Fountas and Pinnell, Pinnell? Pinnell? Pinnell, testing discussion. Um, yes, so we received an email from a teacher. We, I sent out an email uh, a month or two ago inviting staff to come to these meetings and um, to, if they have any ideas or suggestions, to forward them along. And we received a very thoughtful response uh, from an elementary school teacher who um, expressed some concern with the amount of testing we do in the district. And this has been something that we've talked about a few times at the committee level, just trying to get a handle on how much testing happens. And um, we've heard different things over the years, and it's hard to, I think, picture it without being there in person and seeing it, and seeing how much disruption happens. Um, but I was very thankful that we received this email that laid out some of the, uh, the details of how many minutes are spent on these tests. So if you wouldn't mind just explaining what the, Fountain, the Fount, Fountas and Pinnell tests are, what they do, why we do them, uh, if, if we should continue to do them, all of these things. Um, I'm going to defer to Michelle on this one. All right. So, just as a general overview, there are two kinds of tests that we use in school. There are formative assessments, and Fonz and Pinnell falls in that category. So, formative assessments are assessments that are designed to support the learning and teaching process. They're part of what we do on a regular basis, and they're part of progress monitoring. So, how do we know that kids know what we've asked them to learn? And then we have high, take, high stakes tests, right? And we can sit here all night long and debate that, but for the purpose of our conversation, we know high stakes tests to be tests that have penalties and sanctions, and sometimes on the flip side, they have accolades and there are opportunities for advancement and things like that. But 
for us, those high stakes tests like PSSAs are really the tests that stop what we do for a month of time. The other assessments that we do really fall into that formative assessment piece. So they're part of our curriculum, they're part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis to know that kids are growing and, and learning, right? So Fonis and Pinnell, um, why do we use that? So we use Fonis and Pinnell to determine the instructional reading level of students. So that's where we should be meeting that student on a day-to-day -day basis in the classroom. You can also go further and figure out their um, independent reading level. So, if, and they are often different. So where you instruct a student might be higher and should probably be higher than where they're in. So an independent reading level is the book that you can pick up and comfortably go sit on your couch in your living room and read without anybody supporting you. And I feel really bad that my back. Okay. Um, an instructional reading level is where they really need the teacher to be sitting with them. Does that make sense as a differentiator? Okay. Um, so we use FMP to put students into reading groups that match their instructional reading level. So yes, we have what we call whole group reading instruction, which is the grade level reading curriculum. And we want to make sure that every student has access to that because that's the material that's going to ultimately be on that high stakes assessment. But on the day to day, we also want kids to be instructed at their level. And that which I think matters more than the high stakes testing, personally. Right. But so again, we can, yeah, right. So we're going to go just in right. right. Okay. Um, All right. So and what it provides us is a common tool year to year, grade to grade. So I know that your F and P level at the end of second grade should be pretty close to your F and P level at the beginning of third grade. It should continue to move up a continuum over the course of the year, and that's that progress monitoring piece. So if we give it at the beginning of the year and we give it nine weeks later and you haven't moved, then we need to think about the instruction that we're providing. Do we need to provide another layer of support? Um, do we, if we do that a couple of times and we've provided all kinds of supports and the student still isn't growing, do we need to take another step and see if there's something else going on? Do we need to test them for special ed? Do we, but, right. so that's how that fits in. Um, it provides, and for me, this is the really critical part, it provides an opportunity for a teacher to read one-on-one -on -one with a student. Right, so that 15 minutes. Is that the test? Yes. Oh, okay. So a student sits with their teacher and reads a, a, oh. a, a book. Okay. Um, and there's a rubric so that those scores are consistent among and between teachers. Um, and most importantly, it's a research-based assessment, right? So it's not something that we just pulled out of our hats and said, hey, here, do this. It has a whole load of research that goes behind it, which I decided we probably didn't necessarily want to be tonight. If you need it, I can get it to you. But it's really research-based, and it says that, and that research effectively says that when we instruct kids where they are, they grow, right? Cool. So when we give them the tools they need, to be better readers, they become better readers. Well, this is this test though doesn't give those tools. It tells us which tools were. It gives us the clue that we need to use the tools, right? right? Yes. So <laughs> when a teacher reads with the student, so in that moment of I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read with you. Yeah. Or, I'm not going to read with you. You're going to read to me. Uh, I have an opportunity to see if you're reading accurately. I have an opportunity to see the rate at which you read accurately, and that's called fluency. So. We know that as students go through school, they need to be able to access texts accurately and quickly. If you're sitting in a high school AP chemistry class and you can't accurately and quickly access that text, then you're right. struggling to access that material and that opportunity. So that fluency piece becomes important. When I sit and I read with a student, I know if they're self-correcting. So did they read that text and recognize that it didn't Sense and go back. So the dog sat on a fence doesn't make sense. So that F word must be something different. Um, the dog sat on his foot. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So does the student go back and fix their errors or do I have to 
help them go back as the teacher and fix their errors. And those are two really different skills. Um, I get a chance to see what error patterns that student makes. So um, maybe Melanie's kids would do an FP and they know the word the. And so they substitute the for every word in that text that starts with th. So their error pattern is they recognize that that th sound at the beginning, but they're not recognizing what comes after that. And that gives me a clue about what I need to do to support that student. And the last thing that comes out of that is that I really am able to know, did the student understand or comprehend what they read? And students comprehend in three different ways. Um, they comprehend just with the, within the text. So when you told me what happened in that story, if you're just comprehending within the text, you're able to tell me exactly what's in front of you. You're not adding anything to it. You're not inferring any right. meaning from it. You're just simply giving back what the author gave you. Um, you can think about the text. So can you tell me a little bit about why the author might have done that? The author's craft. So uh, the one uh, yeah. concern that was raised was that, that I remember one of the concerns mm -hmm. was that it's kind of subjective. Like that how, with rubric. but with the rubric, even like what, how I, I would be interested in seeing this rubric, and maybe I can find it online. Even. And I can find it for you. Yeah, like I'd be interested to see like what the categories are. Um, but I, do you have a question or a comment or whatever it is? I, I actually came here tonight for. The oh, good. Of and and um, are you, Mister? Uh, I'm Bob Pennington. Mister Pennington, yes. Created, I thought it may have been you, but I wasn't sure, so I wanted to ask. Recognize you a little bit from when I was in school. Um, but yeah, feel free if but you want to. Can we just get the third component of the comprehensive? You were about to tell us the third piece, I right? Oh, sorry, did, did I interrupt? You? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so then the other way that you know how kids are comprehending is are they telling you a whole lot more than what's there? Are they taking what's there? Are they making connections? Are they inferring? Are they almost that? Line? There it is again. It, that almost that reading between the lines kind of. Piece. Here we go now. And that's it's the right. Okay. Thank you. Um, and that's important because it's that back and forth and the student is really leading that conversation. And it's really that direct dialogue. And I, you, you came to time and you came to those pieces. And I, I did some breakdown of the data that was sent to us. And just on a glance, I took those students' FMP scores from the end of the year prior and the beginning of the same year where that data came to you from, and then I turned them all into grade level equivalency so that we were comparing apples to apples rather than letters to numbers. Um, so in the case of the data that we got, of the students in that class, 16 of them were underrepresented by this, the computer test. So if I had used that data, to put students in groups, 16 of them would have been in a group lower than their FMP data suggested that they were capable of being in, and some of them drastically so. Um, that's 73% of the data set that we got. Which data set? The one that was sent to you, as an example. Oh, okay. I and mean... of those underrepresented kids, 38% of them were special ed kids. And so when we sit, and we wonder why we have so many kids in special. It just opens kind of that, the rest of that conversation for me. And so there's a lot of reasons to use FMP um, that are really valid. It does take some time, but it's valuable time. Well, the way the reason, one of the reasons I think it's valuable, if this were something I was going to ask, why don't we have the teachers sit? Like, teachers should be able to recognize almost, well, this, this child obviously cannot read. It's clear just from sitting and reading, but this is sitting and reading. So that's how this works. Um, okay, I want to go to the to Mr. Yeah, Pennington. I, I actually brought a write-up that I'd like to yeah. I don't know if that was up, but I think it's like, I apologize if um, you ask me a question, I have to say, uh, did we hate that because I wear hearing aids, I'm not getting the right frequency. Oh, it's and, uh, the I'm not trying to make any uh, excuses for uh, not answering your questions. But um, I, I think what I noticed is I, I'm in my 25th year now teaching fifth grade, and um, it, is, it is a really frustrating situation when each 
year, now for the last three years, four years, we've had to begin to hear from testing. <clears throat> and um, I think, in theory, that you have these tests that work well for finding the reading level, but you got to look at the practicality and you got to look at the timing of it. And um, to take, like it, I mentioned on mine, I took about five and a half hours in the month of September to get my Fountas and Pinnell test. Now, I feel there's other avenues in which I could find a kid's reading level. Sitting with him, per se, and reading a paragraph out of the reading, I would have a general knowledge of where he stands. Um, and that's just from experience. Um, I also find that these tests are highly subjective. So there is uh, several times this year where myself and other teachers have given these Fountas and Pinnell tests and we, we've not found a difference of one level, but three or four levels in, in regards, like you have a, might have a student coming in, and I, I, for example, I had a student this year that was tested on level U. When I tested him, he was at an S. So um, what happened there? Was there a teacher that didn't spend as much time with this child? Did they make up the results? Was, was there distractions in the classroom? Um, there, there's any factor that could be out there, but um, the biggest thing is that you, you begin the year right away with testing, and I right, this year I have a, a lot of students in my homeroom that have high anxiety, and one way to put a kid out is to give them a test right away, a test in which he feels he's not properly prepared for. Because, like, they, I had tears from some of the kids when they were doing the Go Math test because they felt that they needed to do well on this and they didn't know this and they're asking, what, what's, how do I do this? Well, I can't tell you because i got to see where you're at. But this is, this is compounded by the fact that we're doing these Fountas and Pinnell tests, we're doing study Ivan, reading and math, and then we're giving this benchmark for Go Math. And this is all at a prime time of year, the minutes with our children in the months of late August, September, are probably more important than any, any school days throughout the year. Because you're trying to build a rapport with that child. You're trying to set up a classroom protocol, an expectation. And all of that is thrown out the window when you have to sit one-on-one -on -one with a child and give them a test and give the rest of the class busy work. Three years ago, we were hired substitutes. And the substitutes came in, and then they told the class, I don't know if that is a better option, because you're still then not with your, your kids. But again, they, they, we, we found that we've used tests in the past that have worked much more efficiently than this, and have given us basically the same results. Uh, so a couple of the other things I mentioned, like study Ivan and, and, and the math, uh, Math and reading took two hours to complete. Uh, go math, but benchmark over one and a half. Then it, this is all compounded because you have technology issues. And in, in many cases, the study I've been test took me twice as long as what it should have been because I have kids that can't get online. Or I have uh, the, a laptop card that was signed out and then somebody else had to grab it for another grade now because we don't have enough laptops. We don't have the Wi-Fi is not strong enough, whatever the issue is. Um, so, I, again, if we, we end up having behavior issues arise because these kids are left uh, for long periods of time alone, and not alone, but the teachers in the classroom, but they're working independently, and there's an expectation that these kids are going to be able to continue to do their work and not be um, reminded of what they have to do and the, and the expectations. So, um, and I also found that, again, along with the credibility of this data, we're finding there's not much difference with the data that we receive in springtime as opposed to what we have in the fall. So, with this, with the study I'm in, math, and also with the it's, uh, Fountas and Pinnell test, it delays the start of our reading groups, like our reading specialists now, we're on, we're in the middle of October, and our reading specialist has not taken one group yet. Children. And that's, that's due to this Fountas and Pinnell test and trying to get the results. Uh, study Ivan math and, and the, the Go Math benchmark. We used to have math groups virtually created before the previous year ended. And now we're going in 
I think our actual uh, roster that we have set now was set last Monday hmm. because of all the changes and the moving around and whether or not this teacher is teaching math or this teacher isn't. And so we have all this like, uncertainty. So our children, up until recently, they were still moving classrooms, like trying to figure out where they belong? Is that what you mean? No. Okay. Well, yeah, if based on their level, and again, we were dealing with extraordinary numbers. I had 29 kids to start my math class, and I have an average math group, and I would say, ability-wise, they're not average. It, and so we had to shift that around, and then our math special said, so we yeah. should go from group of 12. One second. So we had, we had to shift those students around, and it involved um, four or five teachers. But, but again, a lot of that came because we had new kids coming in. Obviously, they had to be given some sort of assessment. And we, we also had, uh, we need to do something about the size of these groups. But I, I'm saying, my point is, is that all this testing in the beginning of the year, to me, creates these problems, creates this anxiety, creates these issues. And me as a, as a teacher, I, I don't feel I'm a, I'm a very good teacher anymore. And, and the reason why, because I don't think I teach anymore. I think I'm a, a proctor. I think I am an IT guy, which I know nothing about. And all my creativity, the things that I thrive on to teach, are gone. Because I'm busy trying to look at data and I'm trying to find a technology glitch and get past that. And then my students suffer. You know, they're not enjoying the class because, of, oh, we're coming in another day and we have the test. So that's that's basically my take on it. So. Well, if you wouldn't mind explaining, so for these tests, Go Math Benchmark, um, Study Island Math, what, what is the technological tie? Are these kids sitting in front of computers taking this test? Yeah, uh, Go Math was a, a rate test. That okay. Was a bubble sheet. We had like 50 questions, something like that, 50 questions on that. And then, yeah, and then the study islands all online. And when do when do we start doing study islands? Almost immediately. In kindergarten or like? Oh, you mean grade level? Third grade. Okay. So let me offer the other side of that. Okay. okay. Thank you. So fifth grade example. Fifth grade example. Words row teachers did this. All the same assessments. Yeah. In the first ten days of school, our intervention groups have been up and running for three weeks, and our math groups have been up and running. So I think we just probably need to work collectively to help folks figure out how to do this. Would you mind speaking up just sure. a little bit? Sorry, so with that noise. What I shared, I'm sorry. What I shared was that at Birthrow, and that's yeah. the land I live in, right? Um, we did this. It was done at these 130 kids, right? So right. similar settings, similar grade levels, all that. We started our intervention groups before the end of September. They've been up and running for three weeks. Our math groups have been up and running. So I think part of that may just be helping teachers understand how to do that efficiently because we were able to do it. Well, I can, I can understand the benefit or the desire to have benchmarks at the beginning of each year so you can see development year over year. I can understand that. Um, I, I do, I, hearing about all of this testing, though, I am sympathetic to this idea that, you know, these kids are just starting and they should be able to form these relationships and it shouldn't be testing right <clears> off the bat. Um, I'd be interested in hearing other... Can you, Mr. Miller, explain maybe how how at Amity you approach testing and how we do it at that level? Well, one of the things that, that we did is we've added a test this year, which is a benchmark test. Which be That's benchmark? Is this the GOMAT go math benchmark? The GOMAT okay. benchmark. That, that was something we had to give them to I believe the font of Cornell was very valuable. I think it's something that if teachers administer properly during their reading blocks, that they can do one to two tests per day. And that's what we ask them to do, is one to two tests per day. Some get that finished, some do not. The difference in time is going to be difference in size. We had three grades going at it and very populated grades as opposed to one grade. And Michelle is bringing a lot of new ideas and new concepts to the, to the forefront, and she's at Birdsboro. So, you know, I think that's something where she's been helping us out a lot to get up and going a little bit faster. 
but we did have another test that we had to do. We had the uh, study island test as well as the Fontas Canal test. We have eliminated the Dibbles tests. Hmm. That was done all the way up to this year, so we eliminated that. That was something Dr. C uh, said as well, and I think it was a welcome deletion, you know, as far as the time commitment goes. Uh, you know, maybe we need to fine tune things. Maybe we need to eliminate some things and perhaps put some testing off to later. Well, I'm wondering too, um, just the uh, when we get this information, is it purely for diagnostic information? Like we recognize uh, Joey is not being able to read at the level he's supposed to, so we're going to provide Joey with extra services to right. supplement that. Is that all it's used no, for? And what, it's, no, it's for targeting instruction, good reading instruction. Yeah. There, there are five components of really good scientifically research-based reading instruction. And what it does, if you do an FMP correctly, you, first, it's not wasted time. What you are doing is you, you're actually engaging the student yeah. with authentic literacy activity, and you're if using your teaching expertise, you're gathering information on reading fluency, comprehension, phonemic awareness even in some cases, vocabulary, right. any of the different components of reading instruction. And then what we do is we use that information to form groups and to target our specific instruction, focusing like a laser beam where those weaknesses do exist. So if the child has a vocabulary deficiency, maybe we're teaching them prefixes to help them decode all the different types of vocabulary words that are there. If it's a comprehension type of thing, maybe we're teaching them pre-reading strategies to improve their reading. So what it does is it allows teachers to target specific needs of students and form groups potentially based on those those specific needs, as well as, as they were correctly pointing out, levels that you have. Um, you want to make sure even the materials you're using, and this is the most basic level, is that when you're, you have instructional levels in which you want a teacher working with them, you have frustration levels of reading, which students can, they, it's too hard for the students. Okay, and we have independent levels as where when students can work alone on their reading, it's their reading work. And so that's the kind of information that it provides teachers. What we do have to balance is we have to look at these tests, and I think everyone is consistent on this. We, we want that information. We want to target our instruction, but we want to use the least invasive way of doing that, and that's what we're trying to do. Have we hit it perfectly? No. Are we going to continue to work on it? Absolutely. And, uh, but that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, we'll go to Dave because he's actually on the committee. Then we'll come no, to you. No, no, thanks for arguing uh, over who raised oh, their hand good. first. Okay. No, I'm on the committee. He's just public, so he's <laughs> no, He gets the laughs. I make the same joke. No one laughs. Let's see in here. Oh, that thing. Go ahead. Your turn. Go ahead. Your time's ticking. Um, so, I mean, I, I believe me, I, I understand that data is where it's at. I mean, differentiated learning. The data is so important these days for everything we do, and it's just becoming more and more important for everything we do. But, we're, but my disconnect is... If we're, if, we're, if we're testing in the spring, how is it so much different in the fall, and why do we have to, and that's where my disconnect, I guess, what happens over the summer, over the summer. Um, there's summer regression. Yeah. Um, you have, so um, your example of uh, a student being at a certain level in the spring and then a different level in the fall, there is summer regression. Um, I think giving it in the fall is really key for a new teacher to hear how a student's reading, because it's a different teacher now delivering that instruction. So I think it's really important to start the fall with the teacher administering an FMP so they know what this cue analysis the child is doing so that they know how to teach them and what groups that they need to belong to. And um, so that's just my it's also my really, it is that. also relationship right? right? To sit and read and have a conversation with your teacher about mm -hmm. what you read. So there is that piece too. And let me jump in as a mom whose kids have gone through this multiple times. My daughter's in fourth grade, my second grader's in there. And my my daughter is an anxious kid. She's worried about testing. She doesn't like testing, like what well, the SSA has come, like it, it's nervous in our house. She does not complain one iota about the testing that she's had. Because to her, she's like, hey, we did study on the benchmark. I'm like, how'd you do? She told me your score. I'm like, okay. She said, well, you know, she wasn't real happy with it. And I said to her, it's the benchmark. I said, it's the start of the year. Remember, you have the whole year to grow. And she was fine with it. But it's all in how we couch it. And I am completely okay as a mom for my kid's teacher to sit with her and my son one-on-one -on -one to go, how are you reading? And I, I listen to the reports. And remember, I'm a math teacher. I do not speak this language at all. But at the same time, to have the conversations at every conference, and then to speak and, and teach me what it means and like look we've seen a lot
lot of growth from this time to this time. I had that last year in, in spectacularly. Um, and I look forward to that now. Um, they, the teachers have taught me what I should be asking and what I should be doing. So it is a lot. I understand that there's the concern, but at the same time, my kids get what they need. Well, I have a question though. Do students know their scores on these tests? They, no. She doesn't tell me. She tells me the study island benchmark because she knows the difference between basic, below basic, proficient, and advanced. So Those would it, things. like, let's say I'm a student who may be struggling in math and I take the study island benchmark. Is it going to show me when I'm done taking the test that I did, I'm below basic? I know she knows. Yeah. I, I, like, can, I can actually speak at the middle school. I require all of my math and language arts teachers to do goal setting with my kids. So they actually do see how they did. They set goals for themselves for the next benchmarks, and then they know what they know also, and have that conversation with their teacher about what they need to be hmm. working on and focusing on moving forward. Because I think that that's important. Because if they have no idea, then what's what's behind them even you know taking I, the test? I, the first I day. definitely understand Bob's frustration as he said he's a 25-year teacher, and this is something that comes naturally. Now. We have a lot of teachers with less less than five. Experience. And that's where I think a program like Pontus Penel is invaluable to them because it gives them a, a program that they can follow and get scientifically based results from that. You know, and that's where I do understand the frustration, but I think that's why it's a valuable tool. I just worry that we get overburdened with the amount of testing. That's what I worry about. And we've had those discussions. We've had a lot of give and take about it. And we'll continue to do that. Yeah, well, one, one thing I would think we, we could help Mr. Tangent with is the technology issues. Yes. There. So. If, if you can help us out on that, that would be fantastic. I would well, I, I mean, well, what do we, is it, is it, there's still not enough Wi-Fi over there? Is it, you know, do we, do we need it's more? It's traditionally the login process yeah. that takes forever. Well, we notice when two or three classes are going on at the same time, that's what's the problem. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can work through that because we did it Certain aspects moving forward. So we work with that because it's the initial login when the kids log in, their username, the password. Yeah, those squares. Yeah, they're addressed to the parents, right? Well, I mean, that's how to work. Well, you wanted to say something, Jeff. Do you still have a point to make? Yeah, I was just going to say um, I, I two things. One, the technology thing, I need to address that immediately, I think. But um, so I'm still trying to understand why the big difference between what happened in Birdsboro and and AEC, like why is there such a disconnect with, like there, whether there's five grades in a school or one shouldn't matter, it's administered by grade. Part of it is age. Right. I mean, I was assuming Well, fifth grade, that. compare fifth grade to fifth grade. Right, are they, I mean, well, it's, uh, yeah. the class sizes are nearly yeah. identical. I mean, in fairness, I'm at Birdsboro, right? So. Well, but I mean, okay, are you administering the test? No. No. All right, well then. Yeah. What it, you know. <laughs> and, and again, I think that's. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just asking, like, there's yeah. probably a valid reason. I just don't, I just, it seems odd to me. But anyway, I think that's the, ongoing the timing thing I totally get. Like, I, I, you know, my son's in fifth grade. He, he, he's one of the anxious kids that Mr. Pennington is referencing. And he's extremely stressed about taking the test in the very first week of school because he wasn't mentally prepared for it. He didn't know it was coming. Um, no, my, I mean, my wife's a teacher, so trust me, the kids, there shouldn't be a drop-off in the scores over the summer because they have <laughs> mom school three days a week. So anyway, but point being, I don't care. Like, like I wouldn't be shocked if his scores did drop because in the spring, he's in the full swing of things, and he's rolling, and he knows everybody. He's comfortable with the teachers. He's comfortable with his classroom. And then he comes into the spring anxious in general just because it's a new environment for him. And as much as, as, a, as a, a parent, like I, I sometimes struggle with how much of this is anxiety and how much of it is just like suck it up. But I'm, I'm reassured by our family therapist that it's real and that I need to start embracing it and I see it. So, you know, I don't know what you do about that. You know, like he used to take rocket math and he used to have to take it in a separate room because in the classroom, the stress level was too high and the scores were like, he'd get half. And he was in the top math class. So they used to put him in another room and he'd be fine. But so, I, you know, I'm, there's a lot of kids like that. So I don't know what you do about that. I also 
it would shock me that someone, I mean, granted, I could see a drop off maybe, but like, is there a harm in waiting three or four weeks into school and just getting like a... That. I mean, that's a valid point too, but I would also say, could you not start with the intervention groups right away based on the testing at the end of the last year and then based on observation if you need to move, that students was, can move right, them. So ideally, yes, but then I didn't have that. So okay. I didn't have that, like, so this year we're kind of in that space. But you understand where, what I'm saying. Like, yeah, no. I understand that it might... Base it on spring, it might, it might and be then long for a few wait kids, a month, take it, and then adjust if you need with to. And get comfortable, you have the opportunity to, to move them if necessary. And yeah. then at least you're not... And, and, and at least it doesn't that. cause a delay awesome. in the... Uh, I'm just saying, like, I, I mean, I, you know, know, I'm certainly not an expert. I don't know, but... If you're doing it at the beginning of the year, the harm in waiting for a farm, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. I mean yeah, no, yeah, yeah, we understand. is a month of instruction, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So that student sits in a classroom without any intervention for a month. Well, I'm saying, he's, I think what Dane's saying is just continue you, correct. In, in their groups based on where they were, where they were at the end of last year. Yes. Wait a month, let them sort of get into the swing of things, right. then test them. I mean, I mean, I don't know how much... I mean, to me, you're probably going to eliminate some of the noise from the summertime lull or whatever, and get a more accurate reading of their true like yeah, their you, true results. I don't know, yeah. but no, you, and I've done it both ways, right? Yeah. So when you get to a place where everybody in the building feels comfortable that the person before them administered it fairly and accurately or Well I'm sure there's some of that that goes on. Right. So and when you get to the point that everybody trusts again for lack of a better right. word, that the person ahead of them administered that test and that, that score accurately then then yes. Well, then so, that's, I mean, to be honest with you, if, if, if people feel that strongly about it, that that that's the case, it feels like that's a flaw in the in the test at some, sounds at like some, it is at some level. Yeah, I think you're confirming that. I mean, I know the rubric, is supposed, the rubric is supposed to take and that out of it. I understand how that's administered, but... But it's also that they're my kids now, do I believe... It's right, right, right. And, right. I, would, and, I, would, and I would also say, to the extent... And I, I want to... This is not intended as a judgment of you in any way. But to the extent that the teacher buys into the whole process, it's going to influence the results. If it's clear that the teacher, if if behind the scenes the teacher doesn't want to do it and they dread doing it and they think it's a disruption, it's hard to not have that, uh, not to have that affect your demeanor in such a way that the kids subconsciously pick up on that, right? So uh, the, another potential issue that we're battling here, right, is that is that sort of subjective bias? And I think Mr. Miller talked about uh, you know having two students per day. It, it, it's just not that simple. You you, you are you are trying to balance um, a kid coming up to you and asking you a question, or this kid has to go to the bathroom, or this kid's uh, doing something he's not supposed to be doing. So you don't have the pure time. If you were able to be a reading specialist and pull that child out of the classroom have one on one with no interruption, that process would go much quicker and much more efficiently. Um, this is in no way, shape, or form a metaphor for this, but you can choose two ways to dig a hole. You can use a jungle or you can use a backhoe. The backhoe is going to get the job done quicker. Right now, I feel we're using the shovel because we, it's not only about the timing of the test, it is again the quantity of the test. and, and and, and what is this doing? What is there a faster way for us to get the same information rather than sitting with each child and testing? It, it, it's it's almost like it, it's almost like our judgment is not it's not worthy anymore. Like you have to have some sort of written proof that the teacher says, you know what, this child is needs improvement on comprehension, or this child needs improvement on vocabulary. We can pick that up. That's what we're paid for. We're professionals. We don't need a test to tell us that stuff. I have a quick question. What about the, the recommendation that the SRI replace the uh, Pontus and Pinnell? So that was the data that you gave us. Scholastic reading in the It's a computer-based. I didn't get that. Yeah, it's I'm a computer-based, sorry. It's yeah, a 20, computer-based test. So a teacher never reads with the kids. Uh -huh. You don't. So you're not a fan of that, you're saying? I'm, the well, value and that's is, where my 16 kids were, like, substantially below. Ah, oh, that's what you were talking where, about. Yeah. So when I, went data to data, when I went data point to mm. data point, 
that was where 73 kids were substantially lower on the SRI than they were on their teacher given. Um, so which one's valid? <laughs> strike the middle. Well, you've got kids who are. Yeah, but I mean, if. Uh, okay, so Gee, if it's I always minutes. err on the side of challenging kids up. Always. And I've said that as we've been working with the reading specialists on putting these intervention groups together, when we've got kids who are sitting the edge, I will always err on the side of pushing that kid up rather than holding that kid back. Because to your point, I can always come back and say, yeah, if it's not working, oh, you've got okay, to adjust it. Right. So I will always err on the side of pushing them up. And in that regard, I'll err on the side of the data that reflects the strength being the data that I would choose to use to put that student in a reading group. Does that make sense? I think and so. The vast majority of districts use F and yes. as their yeah. uh, reading diagnostics. We can't leave this, that up to the teacher to decide? Does it have to be a district decision? Like, can a teacher decide which tool to use to put their, their kids in reading groups? So if you are going back to the conversation about having accurate data year over year, you're needing you. Oh, right, right, right. You need it then to Then you lose the that right. continuity, yeah. Right. And, you, and you want it to be something that's research-based. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to spend the time, you want to be able to trust that the results are giving you something accurate. SRI is computer-based. Did kids guess right? Well, like, I don't know. Well, I mean, once you get them in a group, you can move them along quickly with the human intervention, I'm, I'm thinking. Right, like, but I we just put them in a group. Yeah, quickly. Having already had that human interaction and get them. Right, but at 308 minutes compared to 20 or 30 minutes. Right, right. but right. I never read with that good. Which you would through the course of the year then. Eventually. Yeah. But I don't know. I'm, I, 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 hear, I hear the... Um, so if we all required the, the font to set not the FMP at the end of the year, how about the start of the year we let teachers decide which where they want to do, which well, tool they want to use. to get to a place where, where Dane and Jack are kind of at that end of the table, right? Where we know that those end of the year results are... No, I'm saying for, to, for the continuum, well, for the comparison. If you, if you trust use, that your end of the year results are accurate, then you're ready to start the beginning of the year and maybe you wait that first night. Yeah. If you can, so well, if you, you, you don't do, know which, the problem is you don't know who's inaccurate. Like if one right. teacher scores it right. higher or lower, you don't know who's inaccurate. You so just you, know that, but it doesn't matter. You just know that one of them's off. But, but and, it could, matter, and, right? and quite frankly, the concern to me would be, it really doesn't matter which one's off. It's, it's, it's bad because if I had someone too high and they really were lower, then did they struggle that year? And I think that's when you, you, you go look at their grades and the grades, so, so, like, you know, you score lousy in, in reading, but yet they're able to get a, a good grade in reading, they're reading at level or above level, then that would suggest that the test that said that they were lower was probably inaccurate. I don't know. I mean, like, well, I... We would step in quickly right. and check that. Well... The, to have a backup to see whether that's valid. I'm just saying that the, it, it sounds like there's an inherent distrust that from teacher to teacher that e even, like they hand their kids over to the next grade and the scores are off. I'm sure at some level they're sitting there going, well, how'd that happen? They were they were really good. I don't know how they could possibly be in that group. I think point is right. Like you get that summer, not everybody goes to mom school in summer, yeah. right? No, There's but I'm students. saying, you like, get summer, I get it. I, I don't. You get that summer piece, you get that. And, and I think that's why FMP is designed to be administered like every nine weeks as a progress monitoring tool, right? So if you start where you ended, then that student is not going to sit more than eight or so weeks in a place where it's either too easy or too hard. Right. They're going to continue to move, and every grade level has a continuum of things, of score. So ST and U, while they maybe sound really disparate, might be the difference between being at the middle of fourth grade versus the end of fourth grade, which at the beginning of the year, it might not really be the, the big, huge difference it sounds like it is, because there are continuums at every grade level. And I'm sorry I didn't have that bracing, but I can't find it. And we also put all of our eggs just in the end of the basket. There's demos, there's study island. There are also other data points that we need to look at, so it's not just the end of the data points. And it seems like if, if 
Dave had a kid in fourth grade and passed them to me in fifth grade, and I got a, it was very clear to me that my sense of what the kids, what level they're learning at or achieving at is very different. At some point, I can send them an email and say, when you have five minutes, can you we please discuss why you thought that? And Because it, it doesn't I seem to be consistent. Baby. I am saying you did a shitty job. <laughs> Wow. Um, okay, no, I didn't so, mean for you guys to get to But you understand, my point is just that it doesn't, even in situations where it seems like there's a disconnect, we should probably be able to figure out where the disconnect is without too much trouble. I don't, it doesn't seem like a huge struggle to me. Uh, now, once again, I'm not there doing it every day, so there's more to it than that, clearly, but it seems like. What would you say the overall picture is of uh, literacy in Daniel Boone among our graduates at the high school level? I say that because I was really surprised. I learned that the um, one in 10 Americans cannot read. And that was a shocking statistic. The US Department of Education um, did a, a study along with the National Institute of Literacy and they found that 32 million Americans can't read. And among, I think it's like one in four, one in five can't read beyond a fifth grade grade level. So I just couldn't help but think the students that we're, um, that are graduating from Daniel Boone High School, how would we, what would we think of their, their ability to read, quite frankly? Um, I had a conversation with a, a former governor, actually, of Michigan, who said that he thinks the only metric we should use in measuring schools is a child's ability to read. Um, and we should be graduating kids who are capable of reading. And beyond that, it's all superfluous. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing what the picture is at, at Daniel Boone High School. And well, when do we stop testing? Middle school, right? Piece of exams the uh, we'll, <laughs> I, I won't get into that. We had that discussion last time. Are we confident, though, in, in the products that we're uh, putting out? I mean, the, the reality is when you consider the people who we know have a disability, that have a, a, a disability that impacts the reading, we are constantly monitoring that to try to make sure that it's consistently improving. But overall, I think the requirements of our teachers in the reading levels are challenging for all of our students. I think we gear our curricular and our, our materials and the activities to ensure that students are going to be functionally literate, if not extremely uh, able and competent and be successful long term. So I'm not. I don't have any. I'm not like, oh my gosh, I can't. Yes, right, graduate. right, right, right. You know, it's yeah. Because of the reading levels. So no, I'm not. not. It's not something that makes me keep me awake at night. Okay. I figured, but I, I did want to ask, um, because that statistic. You would be doing things and overhauling significantly if, if that was the common belief at this time. Okay. Mr. Pat, can we appreciate your feedback and you taking the time to come yes. out and share yeah, absolutely. your thoughts? Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Good, healthy dialogue. Thank you. <laughs> All right, finally on the agenda, um, I just, uh, or I wanted to have a conversation about early childhood education. I had a wonderful conversation with Mrs. Hefter about this. And I've learned just so much, partly due to the, a new position that I'm taking in Washington, about early childhood education and how important those early years are to developing, uh, to developing brains and developing minds and developing lifelong learners. And for the longest time, I've viewed education as really beginning in kindergarten. And that's not at all the case. It begins, it begins at birth. And in some cases, it begins, I mean, with, you have to have neonatal health, and sometimes it can begin, really, quite frankly, um, during development. So I'd just be interested in learning a little bit more from our administration, how we approach early education here in Daniel Boone, and uh, what we can do better. And I think it's something the school board needs to pay a little bit more attention to as well. So if anybody wants to, to discuss <laughs> any points they'd like to make about how we're doing things in our schools. Um, if they think that there's something that we can do that would significantly uh, benefit our students, um, then maybe, maybe it's only a small change, but it would have a big effect. Um, if anybody has anything, if not, that's fine. It could be something to think about, but. Well, I, I think since I've arrived, the full day kindergarten portion for the needier student who needs more enrichment throughout the day, bringing in the IU with the preschool component, and then adding the earlier intervention for that age group also, having them work closely with Melanie, 
and, and, and the teachers so that it's a smooth transition. And I asked her, you know, from May to August, how many are coming from that preschool component into our kindergarten and where are they being placed? And I think it helps not only identify the neediest, providing opportunities for them, and then trans moving them in, into first grade. So th the goal is to have a stronger cohort coming out, out of kindergarten, make sure that they're getting the needs and targeting it through various methods. But once again, I, I, I really believe that attacking it on, on multiple levels, I think she's doing yeah. a great job over at Monocacy with that. And when the IU came in, it was so important to have them on board and meet with her and everyone to see what they're doing and, and come in. Uh, and those pre k kids benefit from just being in a school setting. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. how to walk in the hallway and how to get their lunch. And so how to be yeah. in school for five hours a day and sitting and following directions and doing so they really benefit just from that being in a school setting and benefit from watching the big kids and how they go about school every day. So and big kids is all relevant. I can't help but think about how I, I think that that is, in many cases, more beneficial than perhaps being able to say five or six more letters of the alphabet when they enter first grade, because those are the skills that are going to um, enable them to learn moving forward. And if you can't sit still, if you can't, if you don't know when to raise your hand, those are much bigger impediments to learning, I'd say, than, than struggling with, uh, with some letters. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, it, do that, Mr. Chris, that the I, Berks IU is in charge of the state early learning. Yeah, uh, and it's PA Keys, right? No, it's PA Key, but uh, it's uh, ELAC, right? ELAC, uh, another acronym, yeah. So, you know, they, um, I mean, that, that focus is on trying to, to get the, the pre-K kids uh, that are in, you know, uh, homes that, that have uh, issues, mm -hmm. you know, single parents or, or uh, both parents work, or there's no one at, at home for the kids, or they're at home in a bad environment where they see fighting and right. Uh, so, so, is there some home visiting tied to that? Do well, folks, no, they're trying to know. get the kids into a, into a safe pre pre K environment so right. that that they 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 don't have the, the trauma and, and, and issues that uh, might affect them later on in life, which you know studies have shown will lead to maybe more you know, jail time or not you know not being as productive in their adult life as they, they can be. Uh, I mean, certainly, you know, uh, a lot of families can afford to have a, a parent at home, but a lot of them can't. Right. Um, when the child, when the child's small. And high quality child care. High, high quality Thousands. child care, and, yeah. and you know, the, this this commission is trying to uh, get businesses to understand that that it's important. It's better to spend the money for this this quality child care right. now than. Uh, yeah. Again, so they can make make sure the taxpayer is paying for it, trying to get businesses to buy it. And it's in helpful it. for the parents as well because you're providing that child with high quality instruction or high quality developmental um, supplement. If you're supplementing that, but then you're also providing the parent with a useful service. So, uh, yeah, I just think it's critical. And I think that um, any way we can reach out to child care providers in the area, in the district, and to preschools to see if there's a way that we can coordinate better. I think that would be in everybody's interest. I'm just going to ask you: Are we aware of any public schools that, that uh, employ any of the Montessori practices? I'm going to go with no, but I have worked in buildings where kids have come from Montessori schools, and that's a tough. I can't imagine that's going to be really it's difficult. It's a super tough transition for kids to come from that. Really well, you talked about you just said. You know, the kids learning from the big kids, like yeah, and it made me it's think, a, like, why aren't why why couldn't that be a even if it's even if it's you know early on, you know, in like first grades, first three grades, within the public school system, then the transition gets a little bit easier. But it just yeah, so I've worked on the other side of it with kids coming in from Missouri and that they struggle to kind of figure out that transition once they're here. They're, they're yeah, yeah. All right, well, if there's no other comment from the board, is there any public comment for the Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting? If not, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.
let me turn this on. 